It was a warm November afternoon in Hong Kong. Local schools were emptying for the day. 14-year-old Charlene Siu Chi Ying said goodbye to friends at St Paul's Secondary School, an old girls Catholic school, and started her walk home. It was the same as she had done every other day. Moments later, Chan Suk, a shop owner, was looking out of her window. She saw a painfully thin girl in school uniform standing still on the edge of the road. As she looked, a bus passed in front of her, blocking the girl from view. When the bus had gone, the girl had collapsed. Chan Suk called an ambulance and ran across the road to help. By the time the ambulance had arrived, however, the girl was already dead. Police would later identify her as Charlene, a local girl from Happy Valley part of the city. The story instantly became front page news. Girl who died in the street was a walking skeleton, said one headline. Thinner than a yellow flower, schoolgirl falls dead on street, said another. John Saunders, a coroner, was called to investigate what had happened. While examining Charlene, he was alarmed. She weighed just 75 pounds or 34 kilos. The average 14 year old, according to Saunders, should weigh around 130 pounds or around 60 kilos. But worse than that, her heart weighed just three ounces, half the usual size for a girl of her age. Charlene's body was so small, many of the nurses in the hospital mistook Charlene's body for a woman in her 90s. During an inquest into Charlene's death, John Saunders announced that Charlene had starved herself to death. Saunders told the inquiry she died of a disease that had never been seen in Hong Kong before, anorexia nervosa. People were shocked. What was this new disease that had arrived so suddenly that it killed a girl on the street? Journalists and analysts started looking. But while that was happening, other young women in Hong Kong started showing the same symptoms. By the end of the 1990s, some estimates suggest that 10% of young women in Hong Kong were suffering with anorexia nervosa. But why? Why had it arrived? And why had it taken hold of Hong Kong's young women? In this week's video, I'm going to be explaining an idea that has been talked about a lot in medical circles. How and why does mental illness spread? Hi, my name is Matt, I'm a journalist and a therapist. I've been working in both fields for years and I found that some of the most interesting ideas about psychology never really get spoken about, whether it's the origins of psychology, how our brains work, or simply sharing some of the best techniques I've learned over the years I've worked as a therapist. The Brink is all about uncovering the world of mental health in a simple, easy to understand way that hopefully helps to mystify what goes on inside our heads. Welcome to The Brink. Now what happened in Hong Kong is not unique. It's an idea that has happened for hundreds of years a mental illness suddenly turns up in a region or community without any prior warning. It's turned up in the UK, parts of the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and I'm going to explain more about those in detail later on. But I want to go back to Hong Kong to help explain what exactly had happened. In Hong Kong, anorexia as it was defined in the DSM or any other Western psychological manual didn't really exist but it did have its own local flavor. The expert in that regionally specific form of anorexia was Dr. Sing Li, a psychiatrist and researcher at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In the 1980s and 90s, he had been studying a rare and culturally specific form of anorexia in Hong Kong. Unlike American anorexics, most of his patients did not intentionally diet or express a fear of becoming fat they complained about having a bloated stomach. They didn't have this fat phobia that we saw elsewhere. Lee would typically see two or three patients a year, 
But after Charlene, it doubled, tripled, and climbed so much that he couldn't handle the caseload alone. But what had happened? To understand that, we need to go back to how Charlene's death was reported. After she died, there was an uproar in the press. A young schoolgirl dying on the street under such odd circumstances was bound to make headlines. But as article after article was published, other questions started to emerge. Questions like, what was the meaning of this strange disease that led a bright young local girl to literally starve herself to death? Well, it can be traced back to John Saunders and his summary of why Charlene had died. He had listed anorexia nervosa as a cause of death, but the term hadn't been heard of much in Hong Kong. Dr. Lee, as we spoke about before, had been studying a local version of it, but it hadn't been talked about much in the press. So when journalists went looking for experts who did understand this new and mysterious illness, they looked elsewhere. Many of the experts were Western psychiatrists who had learned about the disorder while studying in Europe and the United States. The definitions they had been taught suggested that anorexia was an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, according to the DSM, the Bible of Mental Illness. But that didn't match Dr. Lee's understanding of it in his research. Local incidents weren't about fat phobia, as he called it, but about something called excessive bloating. The Western definition was starting to squeeze out the local version. As the media attention intensified, so did the number of cases. It's important here to remember that before Charlene, cases of starvation were fairly rare. But afterwards, they were everywhere. It started turning up in other schools across the city and even in universities. One college reported a 25-fold increase in such disorders. But why? What was happening? The story caught the attention of Ethan Watts, an American journalist who had been interested in understanding how culture affected the transmission and understanding of mental illness. He took a flight to Hong Kong and went straight to Dr. Lee's office. Upon arrival, his first impression was maybe he had been there all along and that the media attention allowed people to finally speak up about an experience they hadn't publicised before. But if that was true, cases would have been documented in schools and hospitals across Hong Kong, right? So Ethan went looking, but he couldn't find anything. Speaking to Dr. Lee, he saw that rates of anorexia had stayed pretty flat in the last 10 years and beyond. So Waters came up with a theory. Was publicity of a disorder actually increasing its occurrence? And if so, how did that work? The answer lay in an obscure French medical journal from the 1850s. In the mid-1800s, Anorexia didn't exist as a distinct medical category, according to historian Edward Shorter. I'll drop a link to his work in the caption below. Anorexia was considered part of hysteria. Hysteria was a catch-all term that seemed to affect exclusively middle and upper class women. But in 1873, French physician Ernest Charles Lesseg came to the conclusion that self-starving deserved its own designation. The SEG coined the term anorexia nervosa and drew up a description of symptoms and a guide of how to treat it. The SEG published his work in prestigious medical journals at the time and gave talks up and down the country on his findings. But as he did that, cases of anorexia started to appear across France. Within 10 years, it spread to London. One doctor based in the British capital said in 1888, that anorexia was now a very common occurrence. Again, it's important to stress, before it was labelled, rates had been flat, but once psychiatrists had popularised it, it started to spread. This idea gives rise to a fascinating concept called symptom pools. This is the idea that each culture possesses a set of symptoms that members of that culture would consciously and unconsciously choose to identify their distress. I'll give you some examples. In Southeast Asia, for example, 
men experience something called coro, a legitimate fear that their genitals are retreating inside their body. In Korea, menopausal women experience hoabiyong, intense fits of sighing and a heavy feeling in the chest, blurred vision and sleeplessness. In the Middle East, meanwhile, there is a condition called Zah, and it's related to spirit possession that entails a dissociative episode of laughing, shouting and singing. The history books are full of these examples. Here's another one. In the 1890s across Europe, men would fall into fugue states and walk hundreds of miles with no knowledge of their identities. Also in the 19th century, a strange leg paralysis afflicted thousands of middle-class women that meant they could no longer walk or work. Edward Shorter's work on symptom pools helped reveal the idea that symptoms and experiences of distress were fluid and culturally specific, meaning they changed from place to place. Now, it's important at this point to state that when people are starving themselves, they are going through genuine emotional distress. What they feel is real, and it's something I've seen in my work as a therapist. But what we're teasing out here is this idea that mental illness is shaped by the culture it lives in. Anne Harrington, professor of history of science at Harvard, described this idea in better detail than I ever could. She said, our bodies are physiologically primed to be able to do this for good reason. If we couldn't, we risk not being taken seriously or not being cared for. Human beings seem to be invested with a developed capacity to mould their bodily experiences to the norms of their cultures. They learn the scripts about what kinds of things should be happening to them as they fall ill and about the things they should do to feel better. And then they literally embody them. It's interesting, isn't it, that there's this adaptation at play, that when we're not feeling ourselves, we unconsciously find ways of expressing that to someone in a way that they can understand and ultimately help us heal from. I'll give you another example of this. In the UK, British researchers studying eating disorders during the 1990s found the rate of bulimia among women suddenly shot up. But in 1997, it started to go down. When they looked at the data, they found something strange. Princess Diana had long struggled with the condition. In 1992, when rumours first emerged about her struggle, recorded rates of bulimia started to go up. In 1994, when those rumours returned, rates rose once again. And in 1995, Diana admitted that she had suffered from bulimia admission rates reached record highs. But after her tragic death in 1997, the rates started to decline again. Now, it's entirely possible that the raised awareness helped medical professionals get better at spotting this in patients. But another theory could be that the discussion of the symptoms and the idea of bulimia helped women in distress unconsciously embody the symptoms in order to get help. I appreciate this may sound odd, but psychology has been studying what they call this bandwagon effect for years. Psychologist Solomon Ash has shown over and over again our tendency to conform to the group. Take a look at this piece of paper. In this experiment, people are asked to name which line on the right is most similar to the line on the left. If you're watching this alone, you'll confidently be able to say it's two. But in Ash's experiments, he has people ask this question as a group, but there's a twist. The group surrounding the participant are all actors, and they all agree that a different line is the same to see if this affected the participant's choice. In Ash's test, more than a third of the people agreed with the group, even though the group was deliberately wrong. Now imagine if you're a person being told by powerful and influential groups that what you're feeling is a new idea, even if it doesn't quite fit with how you understand it culturally and historically. This is what many researchers believed what happened in Hong Kong. 
a new symptom pool arrived and young women started to identify with all the experts' descriptions of what was happening to them. When Charlene died in 1994, the effects have continued to go on. By 2007, about 90% of the anorexics Lee treated reported fat phobia as opposed to the local version that was there before. So where does this leave us? And what does it mean when we think about the idea of mental health being contagious? For more than a generation now, we in the West have aggressively spread our modern knowledge of mental illness around the world. We have done this in the name of science, believing that our approaches reveal the biological basis of psychic suffering and help dispel pre-scientific myths and harmful stigma. And for the most part, that's been a positive. But when we do that, we may have also been teaching the rest of the world that illnesses take specific forms. We have been exporting our symptom pools across the world in a strange psychological form of globalization. That is, we've been changing not only the treatments, but also the expression of mental illness in other cultures. Indeed, a handful of mental health disorders, depression, PTSD, and anorexia, now appear to be spreading across cultures with the speed of contagious diseases. So what can we learn from all this? Well, culture shapes us in ways we're only really just starting to understand. Of course, we can become psychologically unhinged for many reasons that are common to everyone. Personal trauma, social upheavals, a loss of loved one, the list goes on. But how we express those feelings will shape how we experience and ultimately how we treat them. Psychiatrists tell us that all mental illnesses, including depression, PTSD, and even schizophrenia, can be every bit as influenced by cultural beliefs and expectations today as we were when hysterical leg paralysis or czar took hold of populations a hundred years ago. Now, it's important to say, it doesn't mean that these illnesses and the pain associated with them are not real or that sufferers deliberately shape their symptoms to fit a certain cultural niche. What it does mean is mental illness is an illness of the mind and cannot be understood without understanding the ideas, habits and predispositions of the mind that is its host. Thanks very much for watching to the very end. This is a new thing for me. I've been a journalist and a therapist for a very long time, but this is the first time I'm actually doing video. I'm loving making these videos. I'm loving improving them each time I make them. If you love them, appreciate them too. I would absolutely love it if you liked and subscribed and drop me a comment in the comment section. I would love to talk to you. I would love to share more about this kind of stuff. I have a stack of books here for stories. I've got a stack of research papers there that I'm going through looking for these really, really interesting ideas that help us kind of map out like the mental health map that we all live in. So if you like this sort of thing, give us a like, give us a subscribe and I will see you next week.